Amen. 1 Corinthians 6 has some really great concepts here. One that I love is in verse 12 where he says, All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. As a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, we have to understand that through the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we have great power over continued sin in our life, but unfortunately, too many times, we give in and we give up the power. We open up the door to Satan and we let the victory go away. We just let the devil come in and run us and ruin us. And he says there in verse 12, I will not be brought under the power of any. God's will is now that you're saved and you have the Holy Scriptures to operate by and you have the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, is that we would not be brought under the power of any sin. It should not be said of any one of you that there was this sin that overcame you and ruined you and destroyed your life. God forbid, that would totally be a shame. Now, God's given us the power to overcome, and the, the problem is we're weak in the flesh, and there's this constant battle. There's a war in our members, and we have to fight the good fight is what we have to do. Now, tonight, I want to talk about a concept here. Uh, it's interesting. We, we read it earlier in Proverbs. I, I, I drew a just kind of an overhead blueprint for you. This is a rough drawing, as you can tell. A blueprint of a house. And what I'd like to talk about tonight is spiritual housekeeping. Or maybe another way to say it is cleaning your spiritual house. If you would, look at verse number 19. And near the end of the chapter, verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. He says, wait a minute, don't you realize your body doesn't belong to you? You've been bought with a price. The Lord Jesus owns you. He says, God lives in you, and your body is just a temple. It's just a tabernacle. It's just a tent. A house is not a home unless there's a family in the home. An empty, a vacant, a vacant house, well, that's no good. It needs some life in it, right? And that's what he's saying. Look, you have eternal life dwelling inside of you. God is in your heart. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. He gave it to you, right? And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, in your spirit, we have to uh, make sure that we have a good attitude. Your spirit is your attitude in a lot of ways. Hey, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you. You have your own spirit. If you've got a bad spirit, a depressed spirit, a vexed spirit, that's because you've given in, you've given up. But the Holy Spirit is there to encourage you and motivate you and exhort you and, and lift you up. Uh, but we have this choice whether or not we're going to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. God owns it. He already owns you. I want you to understand, God could take you out right now. Any one of us could just fall over dead. We could leave out of here and say, well, I don't know about all that. I'm not interested. And, and next thing you know, you're in a ditch. There was a man just a few, what, a month ago that got T-boned right up here passed away. I hear he used to go to this church many moons ago. He's not here anymore. He's departed. Ye are bought with a price. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you would, go to Matthew 23 with me. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. He tells us there in 1 Corinthians 6 that it's time to clean house. We need to clean up our lives. We need to clean up our body. We need to let the Holy Spirit work inside of us so that God can get the glory. As you're turning to Matthew 23, let me read 1 Peter 4. He says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You understand, God will judge His people first. He wants to come to you, and He wants to reveal your sin to you through the Holy Spirit, and He wants to give you an opportunity to do something about it, but if you don't, then He will judge you. 
He's warned us that there are certain sins, if we continue in that sin, it is a sin unto death. And God will kill you. He will take you home early. Boy, thank God we're saved. It's a free gift. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. If it were by being good, we'd all be in trouble. All right, thank God it's free. And then he says, now I want to live in you. Now, if, you know, and we're going through this right now, me and my family, we're, we've just moved into the house. The first thing we do, we're like, oh my, we've, some of these rugs need to come out. We've got to tear these out. And then, oh, look at this. We've got to clean up this floor. And we've got to tear out this old appliance. And well, these, these walls kind of need painted a little bit. And we're going to take these graphics. And we're going to do this and clean that and move that, right? I mean, that's what happens when you move in a house. Now, think about it. When the Holy Spirit came into your life, the moment you got saved, God came to dwell inside of you forever. And He looked around in your house and He said, oh my, I... I don't know where you learned to decorate, but we got to change some things. Uh, this rock and roll poster, it's got to go down. And hey, hey, this sin that's in your life, this besetting sin, you don't want to give up. I'm here to help. I don't like it. I don't want to be around it. And I'm going to fill you and encourage you to change your life. When the Holy Spirit moves in your house, He wants to change some things. Can you imagine if God stopped by your house tomorrow morning? Oh, God, what are you doing here? I'm coming in. I'm going to take the back bedroom. I'm going to dwell with you. Oh, um, I need to clean up. I know, I'm here to help. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? There might be some things. It's like I've kind of let that one go, and now you're here, and I'm a little embarrassed. And, you know, that's good to be ashamed of some of our sin initially. And it's good to let the Holy Spirit provoke us unto good works and challenge us to reconsider what we're doing, right? You're in Matthew 23. I want you to understand we should clean our house while we can, lest God comes and He takes care of business for us. Now think about it. Your eternal destination is heaven. The Bible says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Our destination is eternal. It's already set in stone. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to look like Him in the resurrection. I'm going to be as He is, it tells me. So if my eternal destination is already set, Shouldn't I start looking a little more like Jesus now while I can by my own choice, by my free will? Shouldn't it become physically apparent that God is living inside of my house? Don't you think that pleases the Lord? It's our destiny to be conformed to the image of the Son. You're in Matthew 23. If you would, find verse number 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. He's using the example of a vessel, which is all we are. Our body is an earthen vessel. It talks about that. And inside of it is a soul, right? And he says, you're just a vessel, and you can't wipe off the outside of the vessel and get to heaven. You've got a problem on the inside. It's in your heart. Look what he's saying. Verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee cleanse first that which was within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. He says, hey, Pharisee, you need to clean your heart by having faith on the Son of God. He says, you've got to get your heart right and believe and be saved. That's the first step. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, work on the outside. I talked about this last week. Um, in James 2, you know, of course he tells us works without faith is dead. And what, but what he's saying in that chapter starts off by, show me. How do I show God that I believe Him? Well, that's in my heart. That's between me and God. I can profess whatever I want, and it may or may not be true. But what God sees in my heart is what matters for salvation. It's a, salvation is a matter of the heart if I trust in Him, if I believe in Him, if I have faith in Him. And He sees it. He knows it. I'm saved. It's done. But then as you as a man, you say, oh, you say you believe in God. Show me your good works. And I'll say, well, I, I read the Bible because I believe it's true. And I try not to sin against my fellow brother because I know that's wrong and God would judge me. And, and you see my works. This world needs to see our works. Now listen, again, we're not saved by works. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, He said, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When somebody actually says, so you are kind of different. You're one of the, you are a different Christian. Because I tell you, most Christians are hypocrites. 
And it's like, yeah, and, hey, buddy, we got room for one more. Come on by. You know, we're all, we're, unfortunately, we're all in the flesh. And my dad used to tell me for years, he said, hey, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it. You know, it's like, hey, man, I get it. I get it. You know, none of us are perfect and none of us are sinless. And yet God does want us to work on the outside of the cup. That's our body. That's how we live. It's our temple, right? Look at it again in verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. If you would go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. God wants us to clean the outside of our house. He wants you to keep up your body for His glory. Uh, that's important. He says in 3 John 1, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. God's will is that we would have a good life and that we would be healthy. That's important. Hey, when somebody's sick, we've got a couple families out right now today, and it's like, man, our heart goes out to them. We're praying for them. We're worried about them. We have several folks with health issues that are going on. And you know what we do? We care for one another, and we carry each other's burdens, and we pray, and we're worried about them, and we pray for them through the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, I, I want you to think about this. When you walk into most houses, the first room that you walk into is probably the living room or the family room, we would call it. The entertainment room. I know maybe there's an entryway and a door. I don't know. You know. Some houses are much bigger. You know. The average house, you go straight into the living room. Is that about right? And so I want to talk about the living room. I want to talk about the family room. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you will, look at verse number 7. Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. This is God speaking to the saved, saying, You teach my law to your kids. It's your job. It's every parent's job. Today we have this public school mentality. I heard literally just this week somebody was complaining to me about the school system in that they, I mean, I sent my kids off and they sent it back, said, they're not learning anything, you got to help them. It's like, well, you're the teacher, you do something about it. And this guy's like telling me how this, the public school's messed up. And I'm kind of like, well, I know it's messed up, man. But you know what? God says here, thou shalt teach them. And listen, your child would be better off in eternity if they didn't understand mathematics, but they knew John 3.16. It's our job to teach them salvation and the laws of God. Your child would be better off in eternity if they, if they were totally confused when it came to algebra and arithmetic and uh, reading and spelling and, and they misspelled every other word and they misspake terribly and yet they had true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's blessing was on their life. They would get farther. And I'm not here just saying, hey, we should be a bunch of dummies. I'm not. But I want you to understand the power of the Word of God. He says in verse 7, look at it with me. He says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That means really taking, taking attention to it. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house. Isn't that what we do in the living room? Yep. Isn't that the family room? Or the entertainment room, as some people call it. Some Families are so divided, they have the man cave over there, and they got the she shed over there. And the kids, they've got their own 84-inch TV and their own PlayStation. They've got their own Netflix account. They can have, oh, they've got their own little fridge in their room. Just leave me alone. Go to your room. I gave you everything. Leave us alone. I'm going to my little cave. But that's not God's will. God's will is that the family would be closer and build each other and help each other. And he says, thou shalt teach them. He says, when you sit in your house. Look what else he says. And when you walk by the way. And when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Wait a minute. When I sit in the house, and then when I get up and leave the house and I walk outside, and then when we lie down for bed, and when we rise up. That's like all the time. That's like four different times. In the morning, in the evening, at dinner time. God's will is we would teach the Bible to our children. If you would, go to Exodus 32. I want to say it like this, and I do think it's very important, but that, that we should plan to teach these things in our house. I believe that we should schedule time with the Lord, period. If you don't schedule time with God when thou risest up, morning devotions, or when thou liest down, evening prayers, guess what? It's just simply not going to happen. 
it's important for you to create the habits of saying, well, hold on, it's nine o'clock, everybody get together, let's do this, right? Uh, even young married couples, I encourage them that they should pray together every night before they end out their day. They should have a bedtime prayer together, one another, out loud to the Lord. I believe that's important. Personal mo morning devotions, this is an individual thing. If there's any one thing that any one of us could do to get closer to the Lord and grow spiritually, it's this. Wake up early and get in the Bible. It's not easy. It's hard. This old flesh doesn't want to get up early. And when it does, it wants to be grumpy till it gets that first cup of coffee or whatever it is. I mean, isn't that how it goes? We not, don't feed the flesh. Feed the Spirit. Go out of your way to search for God. Draw nigh to Him, and He will draw nigh to you. It's important that we don't let the devil control our family time, our entertainment time, with destructive habits. You're in Exodus 32. I want you to see this. Look at verse number 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Wait a minute, rose up to play? I want to tell you this, Christian, you got to be careful how you play. You have to be careful how you entertain yourselves. What games are you playing? What are you entertaining yourself with? What amuses you? Amuse. Uh, you ever think about that word? Uh means no. Muse means thought. <laughs> no thought. I just want to sit back and be amused. I don't want to think about a thing. I mean, that's why theaters are so popular. Uh, you know, if you go to the theater at midnight on a Saturday night, it makes it hard to go to church the next day. Just saying. And when you get there, they're going to pump your mind through all of this junk, and they want go buy our soda and get our, our popcorn, and while you're there, get some chocolate. And then, oh, and there's another movie coming out. You're not going to want to miss that one. And there's another movie coming out. You're not going to want to miss that one. Finally, time for the show. Ah, sit back and just turn your brain off and let us pump our doctrine into your heart and change how you think and who you are and how you respond. I tell you, these theaters, they're, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not Christ honoring. They're not glorifying God. He warns us. He says they sat down to eat and to drink and how to play. And, and, and they rose up to play. As a Christian, there's some things you ought to be doing and there's some things that you ought not to be doing. Maybe you should get a, a, a Bible trivia game. I mean, you can get them for five bucks. You can, get them, you can get a free app on your phone that's Bible trivia, and you can start to learn the things of God. You can listen to audio Bibles. You can watch preaching, and there's so many resources for the Christian. But you know what? You know what? The average Christian, and, and I know you older generation, you don't have this problem, and you may not even understand what I'm saying, but the average Christian from my age uh, down has a problem with video games, and they play games like Grand Theft Auto, or I don't know what's the latest shoot 'em up. Da, 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 da. Yeah. What are you doing? Da, 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 da. What are you What are you learning? Da, 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 da. Kill, 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 kill. Do you think the Holy Spirit's in that? Yeah. Do you think that glorifies God? And don't tell me that your casino game Bejeweled is any better either. Ba -bing, ba -ba -bing, ba -ba -bing. I got a dollar. Ba -bing, ba -bing, ba -bing. It's no better. It's mindless. It's mindless fluff. It takes us away from the reality, the responsibility. We just fill our time. No, no, we're not filling our time. We're wasting our time. We're throwing away our time. And when you get to the end of your life, you're going to say, oh, if only I had more time. I wish I had spent more time with my family or with the Lord or serving others. When we run out of time, we suddenly realize, wait, 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 time is what I really wanted. The world knows how to entertain us, and it hits all of the senses, and it triggers. I, I'm telling you, video games and phones and enter, social media, it's literally physically addictive. You just can't get enough. There's one more right around the corner, and you don't know if you're going to miss out on a good one, and you got to keep going. And you look up, and the day is gone. Oh, I should have read. I should have just read a proverb. It's dangerous. Look at verse number 17. Exodus 32, verse 17. 
And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. If you remember this story, they go up there with God. God's giving them the Ten Commandments. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's like a volcano. There's fire and smoke and all this, and everybody's scared to death. But then they're like, whatever happened to Moses, I don't know. Let's build a golden calf, call it God. We'll worship it. We'll rise up and eat and drink. We'll get drunk, and we'll play. And then they're coming down. God warns them. They're coming down. It's like, oh my, it sounds like they're at war with one another down there. That noise, oh, 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 that noise sounds like war. Look at verse 18. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. It's not like they're uh, playing a game and woo -hoo! No, it's not that sound. Neither is it the voice of them that cry of being overcome. Oh, no! It's neither one of those. He says, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Does your music sound like, like war? You guys know what I'm talking about? Heavy metal? Heavy rap? I, I got to pick on country too. There's some country that sounds pretty vulgar and violent. It's not about what genre of music you've chosen. The beat, the pattern, the words is war. It goes against our, it's not worshiping God. I preached a sermon a while back and I, and I titled it, All Music is Worship. All music is worship. It was created to worship God. You either choose to worship a person, a money, a lot of rap music does, a car. A lot of them are worshiping the devil and they're singing along and they don't even know it. Yeah. That music sounds like war, doesn't it? Bum, 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 bum. And it's like, oh, you just don't like rap music. It's not about what I like and what I don't like. There was a music that they're playing where they're dancing and fornicating and worshiping a, a false god. And they come down and it says, this sounds like war. And the result was sin. Does your music sound like war? Or does it sound like godly praise? Look at verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed up the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Boy, here he really begins to clean house. He's taking some stuff and getting rid of it, isn't it? Have you ever had a moment like that as a Christian where you said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to self-evaluate and I need to go into my entertainment room and I need to figure out if I've got anything in here that would not please the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you don't go to the theater and watch a, a, a movie that demonstrates drunkenness and adultery and sit down and pretend like Jesus is there with you. He's with you. He's in your heart. And most Christians, they don't care. I, I just turn that off so I can get in the flesh and enjoy this moment. We have to be careful of what we let in our mind. Here we see Moses cleaning house, getting rid of the idolatry, the dancing, the music. And I tell you, TV really has become the Moloch or the bail of our generation. It really is. Look at verse 25 here. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. <laughs> Guys, TV is a lust machine. That's all it does. It's pumping things at your brain saying, you want this. You need this. You're not as good of a person if you don't have this version, this model, this color, this flavor, whatever it is. Covet this food. Covet this house. Covet this car. Covet this lifestyle. That's all it's about. It's covetousness. Covetousness. It's a lust machine. Literally. If you would go to Acts chapter 19. Go to Acts chapter 19. In 1 Corinthians 10, he tells us about that event and he says, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. You know, evil means harmful. Evil doesn't mean wicked. Wicked is always sinful. Evil means harmful. Evil is harming somebody, harming yourself, harming your family. We lust after things and we forget about what we're supposed to be focused on and we begin to hurt ourselves and hurt those around us and hurt our reputation or hurt our Lord. We put him to an open shame sometimes because of the things that we lust after. God wants us to work on that. He doesn't want us to let a TV, a tablet, a phone, whatever, ruin our reputation. What would Jesus watch? 
Unfortunately, probably not half the stuff that most Christians let in their house. We can clean our house for God's glory. We can. But we have to search after that. We have to fight the fight. We have to ask for His help. In Psalm 101, He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. You know, when you see something that is despicable in God's eyes, even if you're just standing at Publix and there's a magazine cover of somebody dressed inappropriately or some vulgar witchcraft, you just need to say in your heart, that's wicked. I hate it. I hate it. You say, well, Christians are supposed to only be loving. I, I know, and yet we're supposed to, God says to hate those things. I'm not telling you to be a hateful person. I'm not telling you to grab the magazines and rip them up and show all, oh, you know, you people are evil. I'm not telling you to do any of that. But in your heart, when you see something that's trying to get in your head, you say, nope, I hate it. Not coming in, not in this house. We're not bringing that into our house. We're not going to give place unto the devil. Come on in, devil, have a seat. Wreck havoc. Not around here. We're not going to do that. We need to get the spiritual trash out of our home. There are many forms of entertainment that are really just devils disguised as whether it be superheroes or friendly characters or cartoons. They're really familiar spirits is what they are. And they're enticing. Oh, look at that. Wow, that's fascinating. I've never seen a half animal, half person. It's called witchcraft. That's what the Satanists teach. And they want to teach it to your children. They're not honoring Christ. And it's kind of addictive to watch these things, and it's a stumbling block to your spiritual growth. You're in Acts 19. I want you to see this. Acts 19, if you would, find verse 18, please. Acts 19. Verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, that's witchcraft, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Look, I've had several friends as Christians, and there was even a time in my life with some stuff like this, where it's like, I had this music, and now that I realize I'm sinning against God by listening to it, oh, you know what I could do? I could give it to a friend. Don't do that. That's dangerous. I know what I'll do. I'll put it on eBay, and I'll sell it, and I'll get my five bucks back. Don't do that. It's dangerous. Here he says, they brought their books, and what was the value? Look at it in verse 19. They counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You know what we need in Christian homes across America? We need a good old-fashioned book burning again. Yeah. Woo! Well, I know that's not a popular saying. Just, oh, there they are, those crazy Christians. They want to burn all the books. Look, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe we, we should have the liberty. You can have the liberty to do whatever you want in your home. Don't bring it into my home. But as a Christian... The things that I've wasted my money on that don't glorify God, I should be willing to depart with it. I should be willing to destroy it and honor the Lord. If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 20. I just want to encourage you that we can clean up our house for the Lord. Amen. His will is that we would clean up our house for Him. That he would, we would clean up our life, that we would look like Him, when we do that, He can use us more and more. Now, let's go to the kitchen. All right, we've been in the entertainment room. You guys ready? We're moving on to the kitchen. Uh-oh. Is there anything in your kitchen that wouldn't please Jesus? Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You understand that the Christian that says, I can drink, it's okay, I can handle it. No, no, no. It's handling you. It's ruining you. I just had a gentleman today tell me that he, for years he was given to, oh, it was just a little bit of beer, and I realized, I recognized it was destroying my life. It's destroying my mind, and I can't get things done, and it's bothering me. And, and I came to a point where I gave it to God, and I quit, and I said, praise the Lord. 
God bless you. I'm glad you did. We need more Christians that are willing to turn it around. I mean, here's the problem. These things are addictive. There are addictive substances everywhere. Sometimes they come from your doctor. Or sometimes they come from a plant. Well, God made plants. Surely He wants me to smoke this stuff every day. Beer's not that bad. Wine's in the Bible. Everybody's got an excuse. But you know what? Drunkenness is prohibited. You're not sober. You're not safe. You're not in control. You're giving the keys to the house to the devil. You say, here you go. Try not to destroy it all. Anybody had to rent a re drive a rental car? Anybody ever damaged one? Ah! I'm not alone. I flipped a rental car one time. I blame it on the deer. I'm pretty sure there was a deer there. I don't know. All right. We rent a car, and it's kind of like, well, it's okay. It's not my car. This thing's brand new. Ooh, this thing's a hot ride. Let's do some circles. Let's see what we can do, right? I mean, isn't that what we do with our body when we let the devil take over through drinking, through drugs? Isn't that what we're doing? Treat it like a rental. Do whatever you want. Go to Proverbs 23. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Sometimes we have beer in our fridge, or people keep weed in their fridge, and that kind of thing. And listen, Christians need to get it right. Those things are for medicines in the Bible. And if, if you need a medicine, you use it as a medicine. But if you use it every single day just to have fun or to forget about your day, it's no longer a medicine. It's in control of you. It's determining what you can and can't do. Proverbs 23, look at verse 20. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. You know what a wine bibber is? We call them an alcoholic today. They're a drunkard. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Drowsiness, like I can't think, I can't see, oh, I'm always tired, I can't get things done. Look at verse 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, that's fightings, who hath babbling, saying things that don't make sense, who hath wounds without cause, who cut me? Who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. He warns us in verse 31. Look at it. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. That's the fermentation process. When it's bubbling, there's little microbes, there's bacteria in there eating the sugar and kind of peeing it back out, and that's what makes alcohol. It's a poison to our system, and when you poison yourself, your body reacts in this way to put off the poison where it doesn't belong, and it makes you inebriated. It's literally poisoning your body. That's what it is. That's what gives that drunken buzz state that people seem to enjoy. The Bible makes it clear, don't even look at it. He says, if you know that's going to mess you up, he says, don't look at it. Don't go down there. Verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. You know, there's nothing more sad than a Christian that wakes up and says, I can't believe I said that last night. Yeah. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. That's being thrown all around. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Here's the sad part. It's addictive. It's addictive. When you begin to allow certain habits in your life because it feels good, very soon it takes over and it will destroy you. It will totally, totally destroy you. If you would go to Matthew chapter 5. If you go back to the Greek word pharmakia, I'm not big about speaking the Greek because I can't speak it. All I can do is tell you what a dictionary says. And the, every dictionary will tell you the same thing. Pharmakia is where we get the word pharmacy and pharmaceutical and sorcery. 
Well, that's interesting. We got all three of the words from that same word, and it's in the Bible. In the Bible, it's used as, as such. They repented not of their sorceries, it says. You know, you know how in the end times mystery, Babylon uh, pulls a, a quick one over the world? It's through the sorceries, which could be the deception of TV, the mind-altering effect of a video rate where the frame rate is slower than your eyeball can see. It suspends reality. It kind of gives you this uh, distorted view. It puts your brain in between an alpha and a delta state. You know what sorcery can be? It can be the effect of taking a pill, and then it begins to slowly tingle and work throughout your body and you feel good over here, but then later you feel down because you need another one of those. That's sorcery. It's pharmacia. It's, it's witchcraft. It's chemical poisoning is what it is. It's, it's danger of inviting devils in to take control of your house. And in the Bible, we see the apothecary, and that's good. And you can mix herbs and use fruits. And have, there's medicines that God designs. But we don't take things that are used for medicine and take them as a daily habit and lose our sobriety. Drugs are used to entice spirits to come into the host. That's what they're for. They drink and they fuel and they feud and they give you this angry spirit. If you told me, if you said, well, well Pastor Fan and my, our, our, our marriage were having problems and there's, there's fighting and feuding going on, I would say, are you drinking or doing drugs? Let's ask that first of all. Well, I mean a little bit, but that's not, that's not the issue. No, wait, wait, wait. Maybe, maybe it really is. Maybe that's the underlying issue that no one wants to deal with because that's their escape. And they'd rather be alone doing that than be together working for God and confessing their faults one to another and working for God. Let's leave the kitchen for a second. Let's go to the master bedroom. It's time to clean house. Is there anything in your bedroom that you're ashamed of that you know that if God walked in and He took a look and He said, you have this this should go. Let's look at the master bedroom. Now, first of all, it has to be said, Dad, it's your job to lead. You're in charge. The buck stops with the buck. If a family fails, it's your fault, Dad. There's no one else to blame. Yeah, but she, I don't care. No, no, no. That's the blame game. Well, it's the fruit that the woman gave me. They tried that in Genesis chapter 3, didn't they? He tried blaming her. It didn't work. The buck stops with the buck. The family is to be led by the dad. It's dad's job to lead spiritually, to be the better example, even when you, don't, you just don't know who she is. That's okay. I know who you're supposed to be, and I know who saved you, and I know who fills you, and if you're to be conformed to the image of Christ, why don't you start living like Christ? And even if she's a Judas, you, just, you take it, and you honor Christ, and you glorify God in your marriage. 1 Timothy 3 says that a man should rule his own house. He should take control. And I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about manipulation. Those things are wrong and sinful. And I'm not talking about oppressing a woman as if she's less value. No, in God's economy, in God's eyes, every soul is equal. He's not a respecter of persons. But you know what? He gave everybody a different ability. I drive a minivan. Brother Chad has a four-wheel drive Suburban. I'm not taking the minivan off-roading, right? Well, that's my wife. So I would take my truck maybe, but I would, you, see, you get the point. Like, not every vehicle is the same. Uh, you could say the same about appliances, right? Like, uh, I'm not going to put my shoes in the dishwasher. That would be foolish. It's not going to accomplish anything. And I'm not going to put my fine china in the clothes washer. They're all washers. What's the difference? Well, God made man and woman different. And when we find our perfect order, man setting the standard and leading the house as he ought to, spiritually growing, say, hey, guys, I know I've been dropping the ball, but we got to get this thing together, and I want to help us get closer to God. We're going to have a family Bible hour. We're going to have a family altar time. We're going to have some family prayer time. Uh, hey, baby, I, I love you, and I'm sorry I haven't been doing it right. Let's get up early and study together. Hey, before we go to bed, let's just get together and let's pray to the Lord. If Dad would do these things, it would fix a lot of problems in America. Yeah. Titus 2.5, for the mom, it says that she should be a keeper at home. That does not say being a housekeeper. A keeper at home. You know, you, now when you guys, you guys know what they call a goalie in soccer. You know another word for it? Goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. I'm protecting it. I'm defending it. 
So here's what happened. Dad sets the standard. He says, hey, you know what? I think our house ought to look like this. I think the foundation ought to be Christ. I think in our kitchen we should have no alcohol. I think in our, in our living room we should uh, get rid of any of the entertainment that doesn't honor the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get that out of our house. And then when Dad leaves to go to work and provide for the house, Mom can then say, well, I'm going to keep the standard that's been set. I'm going to protect it and defend it like a goalkeeper. I'm going to not let the devil in and ruin things while dad is gone. That's what a keeper at home really means. She's keeping the standard that the husband has already established. In 1 Timothy 2, he says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And you know who took the blame for Eve's sin? Adam did. It was his fault. It was his fault. That's God's order. In the master bedroom, dad be the master. Take the responsibility. If you fail, just fess up and say, okay, let's, let's get closer to God. Let's fix this. Mom, don't usurp his authority and uh, constantly be henpecking, right? For those that have chickens, I know a few of y'all have chickens. Hey, what's henpecking mean? I told you so. Why don't you let me do it? Hey, I do that better. You did it again, didn't you? Oh, you messed up. That's what I was joking with my wife earlier about. Oh, I messed up. We write that on the calendar. You know, we, we have a good banter. I love it. I'm thankful for my wife. What, what he's, who, who so findeth a virtuous woman? Boy, what a good thing. Who, who findeth a, a, it's of the Lord when you have a godly wife. And I'm thankful for uh, the young unmarried that's about to be married and I want to help set the standard. Listen, if you live in a broken home or th things haven't worked out well, I'm not picking on you. I'm not trying to bring you down. Uh, if you're divorced and remarried, stay married. If you've messed up and lost your purity, don't do it again. Stay pure now. If you've quit the drinking and the drugs and you're, you're off the addictive TV things, whatever it is, stay off of it and keep fighting that fight. Amen. Lastly, let me ask you this. What's in your closet? Uh-oh. <laughs> probably, probably a pistol and some silver quarters, right? If I had to guess. All right. <laughs> what else is in your closet, though? I mean, there's nothing wrong with either one of those, okay? What, what's in your closet that if Jesus went through it, he might be ashamed of you and say, now, 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 you know better than this. I've told you and I've shown you in my spirit. What's in your closet? In 1 Timothy 2.9, it says, in like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modesty. Modesty is very important, and the young ladies growing up now really need to hear this. Modesty, even the definition, is often misunderstood. Modest, or let's go the other way, immodest is doing something specifically to get attention. There's a yellow Corvette that speeds by on this road. I don't know who the guy is or whatever, but that's not very modest, is it? Now, if you have a 10-year-old beater truck and it's paid off and you zip on by, I don't even notice you, but it's the guy in the, in the hot rod. It's like, oh, look at that guy. Well, he got the attention, right? Now, why don't you think about this? We're called to dress modestly. We're told to present our bodies representing God, God not in an immodest way, trying to ga gain attention to ourselves. You guys are in Matthew 5. Look at this. Matthew 5, go to verse 28. Matthew 5, verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus took it to a whole other level on the law. They said, hey, I can look but not touch. Jesus says, that's not, no, no, no. You're lusting in your heart. You're committing adultery with somebody else's wife. He says, that's a sin. Let's confront it and call it what it is, right? Oh, man, that's a higher standard. Jesus didn't break the law. He raised the standard. But I want you to notice here that he says, hath committed adultery, look at these words, with her, with her already in his heart. Ladies, I want to challenge you that if you dress immodestly, if you are trying to attract attention to your body, your body that belongs to your husband and him alone, then you are, a guilt, you are guilty of adultery as well. This is a higher standard. Go to Proverbs chapter 5. 
In Proverbs 7, he says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. There is a certain clothing, a certain outfit that is like a harlot. And I don't really have to describe it. Every one of you knows what it looks like. If one went walking by, they'd say, well, that dirty harlot. Look, she's trying to be a harlot. I mean, we know what we're talking about here. The Bible uses some strong words, nothing impure. It does use the word whore and harlot and whoremonger. That's somebody that's involved, anything involved in the process of sleeping around outside of marriage and uh, undermining God's rules for marriage. And he says that there was a woman that had the attire of an harlot. Here's the warning. Stay away from such a person. Here's the warning. If you're saved, don't be such a person. Young lady, don't use your body in the wrong way. You're in Proverbs chapter 5. Look at verse 17. Of the wife, it says, Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Oh, it's funny. We were just talking about this. There's a guy around the corner that his wife is a bodybuilder. And she goes competition bodybuilding. We heard about her last week, and I guess you guys met her out sewing. That's not natural. That's not normal. If my wife said, hey, I want to do 100 push-ups a day, and I want to lift 200 pounds so I can put on a bikini and go show my body to strangers all over the world and get on TV, I'd say, no, that belongs to me. You're not sharing it with anybody, right? This is the biblical standard. Let them be thine only, thine own, and not strangers with thee. Verse 18, let thy fountain be blessed. He's speaking of the wife, the marriage relationship. And rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breath satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. Always be excited for your wife. She's enough. Be content with what God gives you. Look at verse 20. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? He warns them and says, don't go looking at it and certainly don't touch it. Go to James chapter 4 and we're going to finish there. Go to James chapter 4. Men, we have to avoid looking at adulterous women in your closet if there's some clothing or there's some magazines or there's something going on in there that God's not proud of. You better fight to clean your house. You better get it out of your house. I heard of a woman recently, and she did some spiritual housekeeping. And she went into her closet and through prayer, and she said, Lord, this, does this please you? It's just a T-shirt. I mean, it's an ACDC T-shirt. Do they sing about Jesus? You know what? Throw it away. What about this, Lord? Does this outfit please you? Does this honor you, Lord? Well, why do you put it on? Well, to get men to look at me. I shouldn't do that. And she did some spiritual housekeeping and she threw out some things in her wardrobe because she wanted to honor the Lord. And listen, modesty isn't just about wearing dresses. There are dresses that go all the way to the ankle, but they're so tight that you, it just doesn't take any imagination to figure out what's going on. We have to be careful with our clothing and make sure they're not attracting attention, causing somebody else to commit adultery by lusting. We have to fight against lust. And that's a two-way street. In Isaiah 47, you're in James 4, but let me read this to you. In Isaiah 47, he speaks of nakedness. In verse 2, he says, Take the millstones and grind the meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. Do you know what the Bible is saying? Is that your nakedness stops right here. The Bible is saying that your knee should not be exposed. We should not have, uh, you should not be swimming with people that are dressed inappropriately. Christians shouldn't have mixed swimming where people are exposing their nakedness. Nakedness is defined in the Bible from the knee, because where does your thigh stop? All the way down to the knee. It, it, that's where we stop. That's how we should dress to honor Christ. He says anything else is shameful. It shouldn't be shown off. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, he says. Uncover the thigh. From the neck to the knee is nakedness, and we shouldn't shame ourselves, and we shouldn't shame the Lord. And if there's things in your closet that you walk in and say, okay, Lord, and, and I mean, listen, talk to the Lord honestly and say, Lord, does it please you when I wear this? If not, I'll let it go, because I want to please you. 
Genesis 35, listen to this verse. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Go figure. They're watching the idols of the world. They've accepted the worldly standards. He says, clean up your life, change your clothes. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. You're in James chapter 4. We're going to end with this. Look at verse number 4. James 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, if I said, who wants to be God's enemy? I, I really believe no one in here would raise their hand. No, no, I want to be God's friend. I want to be close to God. He's trying to warn us that we become adulterers and adulteresses when we make friendship with the world that has a different standard. Men and women alike, listen, if somebody of the opposite sex gets close to you and they're a friend of the world and they dress like the world and showing their breasts is, they, oh, that's, that's okay, that's acceptable, everybody does it, or showing off their thigh, they're okay with that. We need to avoid that or we're going to become the enemy of God and we're going to be punished in our life. If we want to really clean up our life and clean up our closet and clean up our house when somebody gets close to us and they're, they're going against God's standard, we have to recognize that's a friend of the world, and I want to be a friend of God. I don't want to be God's enemy, and if I lower my standards and I compromise and I spend time with this person, I'm opening the door to the devil coming in and ruining my life and ruining my family. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The thing is, God has a plan for you God literally has a plan for you that's different than me. He wants you to clean up your house. And once you get the Holy Spirit really strong in your life, you know what He wants next? He wants you to go out the door and go to your neighborhood. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants you to clean it up, get it better, do some housekeeping, purge your life, get that junk out of your life so you can be a testimony for Him, so you can be a witness of the gospel, and then He wants you to go into your neighborhood. And He wants you to tell everybody. He says, hey, hey man, I'm a Christian, and you know what? I used to be a drunk, and I'm sorry, and I'm ashamed of that. And if I ever offended you, please forgive me. By the way, do you go to church anywhere? By the way, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? God's will is you clean up your house and then you can spread it to your block. Change the hood. How about that? Let's change the hood. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we love you and I thank you that you've used our body as a temple for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would let these words go down in our heart. Lord, I pray that right now through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would reveal to us the areas in our life where you want us to get closer to you. Lord, I want to be a better Christian, and I want to be a friend of God the rest of my life. I'm thankful that you've saved me, Lord, but now I want to live for you all my days. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to become better Christians for your glory. Help us to clean up our life and clean out our houses. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.